Welcome to Mountain View. Thanks for joining us today. Whether you're new or this is your church home, you can find everything Mountain View on our hub at mtnvw.org slash hub. There you'll find info on giving, life groups, and kids. If you're new or have a prayer request, make sure to click the connect button. Stay in touch during the week by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Before service starts, we want to give you an idea of what to expect. We will begin by singing a few songs together with the purpose of glorifying God through praise and worship. The lyrics will be displayed and we invite everyone to sing along. Following our songs, one of our teaching pastors will share a message about the good news in a relatable way with the hope of growing our faith and understanding of God. Finally, we will take communion and sing again as a response to God's goodness. We also have programming for your kids and students throughout the week. You can find more information by going to mtnvw.org. Whether online or in person, we are so glad you're here. Let's get ready to worship. Well, good morning, Mountain View. Would you stand as we begin to worship together? Conquers all anxiety. Come, let it rise. Let praise arise. We see your name in the dark, and it changes everything. We sing with all we are, and we claim your victory. Come, let it rise. Let praise arise. Break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall For fear cannot survive When we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high With all creation cry God we praise you Oh, we praise you song that overcomes the raging sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Come, let it rise. Let faith arise. Let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For we cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. Come on. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. In our creation, we're going to see you break. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For 
fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. My name is Zach, and it's so good to be worshiping with you here this morning. Whether you are in the room with us here or you have tuned in online, we're so glad that you have chosen to worship with us here at Mountain View today. Now, last week, uh, Steve read us Psalm 105 as our call to worship, and today I'm going to be reading the Psalm 121, and again, don't be concerned, it's only eight verses. It says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Now, I know it's been a, a weird week in a lot of ways. Even if it's been normal, I'm sure you can think of something that's like, huh, what was that about? Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a spiritual storm that you're going through and you're having to wrestle with God a little bit. Maybe it's a mental storm and you're kind of fighting some doubts or some worries. Or maybe even uh, maybe it was in a, a physical storm, like the tornado that blew through that was just bringing fear and, and damage. Whatever it is, God's better than that, and he's stronger than that. And he cares about you, and he loves you. And he's glad you're here today. Now, as we move into this next time, as, as we continue to worship together, just think about that. Think about how far God has gotten you from and where you are now and, and what he's blessed you with. Crimson stain, he was. 
God, let that be our prayer this morning. That we would be overcome by your presence. God, we invite the Holy Spirit into this place now, into our hearts, into our minds. And as we move into this time of offering, let what we give be a reflection of our love for you and those around us. We thank you that we can come together and worship in community and fellowship with, with all these believers here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. As a result of your financial stewardship, we are able to teach children and students about Jesus. Through our regular weekend programming and special events throughout the year, we provide a safe, fun, and caring environment for faith to develop. Your tithes and offerings are an investment in the future. Thank you for your continued support. You can give by going to mtnvw.org slash give, texting the amount to the number on the screen or by mail to 40 East Highlands Ranch Parkway. Thank you for giving to Mountain View. Good morning. I'm Dan Hubbard, one of the elders here, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I get to introduce um, who's going to be sharing with us this morning, Matt Trombley. Uh, Matt is a native of Colorado, currently living in Parker, and loves the Colorado Colorado outdoors, whether on his own two feet or his mountain bike, Matt and his wife Mary recently celebrated their 22nd wedding anniversary by climbing their first 14er. And they are steward, and they steward five children ages 11, 12, 14, 14, and 16. Matt holds a bachelor's degree in management from the University of Phoenix and a master's degree from Dallas Theological Seminary. Matt recently answered the King's call to leave a 24-year career, 24 career in financial services in order to serve as the president of Rocky Mountain Foundation. Let's welcome Matt. Hey, thanks. Well, as anybody who's ever climbed a 14er can attest, it's as important to climb it as it is to get back down. And so we're back. <laughs> we both made it down safely. Yes, yes. Um, well, it's great to be here. I am excited to be with you. Uh, it was great to be at the 9 o'clock service, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be with you guys today. We're going to take a break from Acts and go into Joshua chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, you can take your time or hurry up and join to jo or turn to Joshua chapter 5. What I think you'll find is that the principles in Joshua 5 are really close to where we were going to be in Acts chapter 5 as well. So if you're studying along at home with Acts as, we, as you guys have been going through the service or the sermon series um, I think you'll find that a lot of parallels between what we learn about Joshua and what we were learning in Acts. So um, just to set the stage a little bit, um, before we jump into the content, though, I do have a question for you all that I'd love for you guys just to ponder a little bit. And the question is this, what does it, ta or what does it mean to take a stand? We, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of bantered around that phrase, take a stand, take a stand, take a stand for this, take a stand for this person, take a stand for this cause. What does that mean? What does it mean to do that? I think what it means is that you declare your allegiance to something. I think it means that you declare your loyalty to something. I think it means that you declare that something to you is right or wrong, or maybe to a truth that declares it it's right or wrong. So to take a stand is to declare those things. And there's some been notable people in history, some of whom are very familiar to you, who have taken a stand. Um, Rosa Parks in the 60s is one person who took a stand by staying seated. She took a stand against bigotry and racism. Um, Corey Ten Boom, who some of you may know, um, was a prisoner in a concentration camp during World War II. She took a stand because once she was released, instead of preaching against her captors, she preached forgiveness. And whenever I hear something from Corey Ten Boom, I think I should probably listen to it. Because um, if there's anyone qualified to speak about forgiveness, it's somebody like her. Um, there's also somebody that I just recently learned a lot about, Brother Yoon, who was one of the first house church pastors in China, who was imprisoned for his faith, I think, three or four different times by two different countries. In one imprisonment, they tried to get him to abandon his faith. Instead, he went on a 74-day food fast. 
I'm, that's biologically impossible outside of a supernatural intervention of the Lord. 74 days. And I said, all you have to do is renounce your faith. He took a stand. He took a stand. And he actually led his prisoners, to, uh, fellow prisoners to Christ because he said, look, do you not believe in miracles? 74 days. How am I still alive? And they immediately got on their knees and gave their lives to Christ. Because they said, if that God can save Brother Yoon, he can save me. These are people who took a stand for something, that there's a standard that they were holding to, that they were pledging their allegiance to, that they were declaring their loyalty to, and saying, this is worth fighting, this is worth standing for, this is worth aligning with. The truth that we're going to learn in Joshua is this, that God is holy. God is holy. And therefore, the standard of a Christian's life, if you declare yourself a Christian this morning, if you've been baptized, if you've been uh, professed faith, if you've declared, I follow Jesus, then your standard is to make Jesus the holy one of your life. That's my standard. That's your standard. That's the life, that's the standard for the Christian life. We are called to be a reflection of his holiness. We are called to be ambassadors for Christ. So we should act like who he is. If God is holy, then we should reflect that onto people that we work with. We should reflect that onto our children or our grandchildren or our friends at school. We should reflect that onto the people we interact with. That is what we are called to do. And spoiler alert, as the kids would say, I want to give you the invitation right up front so you can be thinking about it. The invitation is this, that as we go through today, as we listen to the word of the Lord, would you take inventory? Would you take stock of your choices of your life, of your attitudes, of your behaviors, of your loyalties and allegiances, of where you've taken a stand or whose standard you're following, to examine anything in your life that isn't submitted to Jesus as the Holy One of your life. That's the invitation. God is holy. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be holy? Oftentimes we think about holiness as moral purity. And yes, God is morally pure. He is an altogether righteous. He's the only righteous one. But holiness actually, when it's defined in Scripture, actually means to be set apart, to be unique, to be completely different from anything else that can be found. So when we're called to, when we say uh, God is holy, it means God is different. God is set apart. It means that we are to be holy and to align to God and nothing else. Nothing else should demand your loyalty other than God. Everything else should be secondary or tertiary or I don't know what the fourth thing is, but it should, it should be after God. <laughs> because God doesn't ask for partial loyalty, does he? Does God ask for conditional acceptance? Does he ask for meager obedience? No. He asks for everything. And he gave everything to you. He held nothing back. God must be the unique and unquestioned authority, truth, promise, trust, opinion, and standard or loyalty in our lives. There can be no competition if we're to call ourselves followers of Jesus. Chuck Colson put it this way, that holiness for the believer is the everyday business. It evidences itself in the decisions and the uh, decisions we make, the things we do, hour by hour and day by day. This is not a one-time thing. This is an every day. You get up, you make your coffee, what do you do next type of holiness. How is it distinct? How is it set apart? How is it under the holiness of Jesus? So our everyday choices reveal who is highest to us. Our everyday choices reveal who is our prime. Our everyday choices reveal who we follow above all else. And the story we're going to look at here in Joshua chapter 5 is about a story about a familiar character to most of us if you've been in church for any period of time. But a choice where Joshua had to make to declare that Jesus was the Holy One of his life. So let's take a look at it. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Um, and I want to just give you a little bit of background. Joshua is a familiar name. He's a familiar character. He has two VeggieTale movies. That's where you know you've arrived as a biblical character when VeggieTales... I don't know what vegetable he was, but that's okay. Um, but anyway, so Joshua was pretty famous. He was one of two spies that went into the land, spied it out, came back, and said, we can take him. Why? 
not because we're the biggest, not because we're the baddest, not because we got the most guys, but because God said so. One of two spies that came back and said that. He was the military commander during the battle against the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Amalekites. I think that's right. Um, <laughs> sorry, Amalekites, um, which is the battle where Mo- they had to hold Moses' arms up. And every time they held him up, they would win. And every time they would come down, they would lose. So men held Moses' arms up. Um, he was mentored by Moses, chosen by God in a special revelation. A voice of God says, you are going to be my leader. You're going to take my people into the promised land. You will have no defeat if you follow me. God chose him specifically. And he led Israel into the conquest of the promised land. And he had one of the best, uh, as the kids say today, mic drops, right? Now, I don't think you should really drop a microphone. I think Mark would, would agree with me, right? Like, you should just set it down. Like, don't drop it. You'll damage it. Like, what did it do to you, right? But you should just set it down. So but Joshua had one of the best mic drops, as the kids say, in all of Scripture. After he lived his whole life, he got to his deathbed and he said, you guys can all do what you want. But as for me and my house, we will... That's Joshua. But this choice that Joshua had to make early in his career as a leader defined the whole thing. This one interaction. So let's take a look at it. Verse 13. Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or are you for our enemies or adversaries? And he said, no, (laughs) no, Uh, rather, I come now as the captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the host said to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This is the word of the Lord. Let's double click a little bit. Let's go verse by verse. Verse 13. You see, Joshua was leading God's people into the promised land. God had parted a major body of water, the Jordan River, a second time. The second time he did that, he had parted the waters. Joshua and the army of God, along with the people of God, went through the waters into the promised land. It's estimated he had about 50,000 battle-ready soldiers with him. No small contingent here. He also had several million civilians coming with him. This was not your general run-of-the-mill hike with your buddies into the promised land. This was an invading force. This was a country moving into another country. This is what Joshua was doing. And they were approaching their first city, Jericho. So here we have God's chosen man on God's chosen mission with God's chosen people. His credentials were unmatched, Joshua's. And this was the first city that, they, that God said, you will capture in the promised land. And then verse 13 says, he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Now remember, like they're, in, they're an enemy invading force. It's a very, very natural question for the commander of the army to assess, are you for us or, or are you an enemy? Because other than Rahab and her family, who had had given Joshua intelligence, everybody else was assumed to be an enemy. Very logical question by Joshua. But this man gave Joshua no room but to interact with him. See, he stood in Joshua's path. He didn't just stand there like, hey, how you doing? He stood there with his sword drawn, which is the ancient equivalent of somebody having their gun drawn today. And as any gun owner knows or gun safety trained people know, you don't draw your weapon until you're ready to use it. And you certainly don't cock it, you know, the trigger, unless you're ready to use it. This was the ancient equivalent of having your gun drawn and ready to fire, standing right in front of Joshua. He was saying to Joshua, physically, we're going to do business right here. This is the scene. And Joshua, remember, has 50,000 soldiers behind him and a couple million civilians behind that. So this man Joshua encounters, he forced a confrontation. And Joshua says, are you for us? Are you for the people? Are are you for the enemies? (laughs) And and I always chuckle. I've read this, I don't know, a hundred times. But but I've read this verse so often, I always chuckle because he says no. 
And I'm like, it was an A or B question. And he's like, no. (laughs) But thus begins the lesson for Joshua. Because God is holy. You don't put God in an A or B box. And so Joshua started to learn about the holiness of God right then and there with that one response. Because what God was starting to communicate with Joshua was, I'm different. I'm not like anything you've ever encountered. And you can't put me on your team or somebody else's team. I'm on my own team. Now, I've said this a couple of times, and you may be wondering, where does it say God in this passage? I'm inferring from three clues that this is God. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. The first clue is he he announces his purpose or his role. He is the commander of the Lord's armies. There's only one commander of the Lord's armies in Scripture. It comes from Revelation 19.4, and it says, He comes, and he comes on a white horse, and his name is Faithful and True, and he comes back, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? He is coming back, and that is how he's coming back, and it is said he is the commander of the Lord's armies. So one is his office. The second is his acceptance of worship. In all of Scripture, when you see angels show up, if somebody tries to worship them, their immediate reaction is, don't do that. That's how Satan got where he was, where he is. Don't worship me. I am simply a servant like you. John in Revelation tried to worship the angel who was in heaven, (laughs) and the angel said, please, 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 don't do that. I am not God. No angel would accept worship To do so would be the sin that Satan fell for. That's the second clue. Only God is worthy to be worshipped. Jesus said it in Matthew 4, 9. You shall worship the God and your God alone. It's the first commandment. (laughs) You shall have no other gods besides me. And the third clue is this. In verse 15, it says, uh, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. There is only one being in this universe who can make ground holy, and that's God himself. And Joshua, mentored by Moses, would have understood this because his mentor had a similar encounter at a bush that was burning. And God said to Moses, Moses, take off your sandals for the ground you're standing is holy. So I think what we have here is Joshua coming face to face with the Lord of the universe. And Joshua's reaction is very telling as well. He acted quickly and decisively and his declaration was clear by his actions that he understood who he was talking to. I need a a helper, probably one of the holiest guys in the church. Mark Mark Ibsen, can you come up here? Um, I I just need a volunteer to play the role of God. Can you do that? Sure. Okay, that's great. (laughs) All right, stand here. So you guys know Mark, right? 20 years behind that sound booth. Sound booth guys are like offensive linemen in football. Nobody cares about them until they do something wrong. Right? Until something bad happens and the quarterback gets smashed. Right? Nobody th- but Mark, 20 years of service, actually more for this church, but 20 behind. So yep. let's give Mark a hand. Thanks for serving the Lord. All right. So, so what I need you to do, Mark, is just stand there. You don't have to pretend to have a sword, but you can if you want to. Why yeah. not? All right, why not? All right, there we go. So, so when we think about what Joshua did here, it says in verse 14, I'm um, sorry, uh, yeah, 14, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down. In our modern customs, we would think of this a little differently, right? When we think about bowing, here, let's, uh, let's turn you just like this. There we go. Okay. Um, when we think about bowing, you might think about like if you're at a martial arts class and you, and you bow, right? You bow a little bit to show respect, right? To show, hey, I respect you as my opponent or as my master. You, don't, you oftentimes keep looking at the person because you don't quite trust them, (laughs) okay? You're like, I don't know if you're really friend or foe here. I'm going to keep looking at you. If you're in the Eastern cultures, um, like uh, Asian, Japan, China, some of those cultures, you might bow at the waist, right? You might bow with your head down, especially if it's your boss or your elder or whatnot. You might show even more homage than that. Um, That's not, neither one of those is what's going on here, okay? In In the medieval times, you'd see knights and they would bow like this with one knee, right? And the king would, would knight them um, with a sword, and it was showing trust and fealty to the king, right? That's not what was happening here either. The Near Eastern tradition, when it says to bow down, is one of two things. It's either with both knees, okay, with your hands on the ground, and you put your forehead to the ground like this, or, or, even more so, and I think this is what Joshua probably did, it's you actually, whoa, those are good sandals. 
Do you always get to wear sandals at church? Oh, yeah, because they um, got to hide. Ah, <laughs> all right, cool. All right, so you would actually sit here like this, and you would be totally prostrate like this. Now, remember, remember who this man is, right? He said, no, I'm the commander of the Lord's armies. He has his sword drawn in his hand. There's 50,000 soldiers and millions of people watching Joshua and is in encounter with this man. And Joshua does this. And he demonstrates not only to this man, but to his soldiers and to the people that he was submitting wholly to this, guy, to this man, that he was giving up his physical safety, that he was giving up his leadership, that he was declaring he is now the leader of us. By doing this, he was giving everything he had to God and saying, I give you, if you want to take my life right now, you can. There's nothing I can do to stop you. He was fully surrendering to God. That's the posture that it's talking about in verse 14. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Give him a hand. And that's important for us to understand because how often do we give just partial respect to God? How often are we only bowing part of the way? How often are we saying, God, you can have total control over this part of my life or on this day of my week, but not others? That's not what Joshua is doing. That's not the lesson. God is holy. Therefore, the standard of the Christian life is to make Jesus the holy one of our lives. Joshua's actions understood that he was speaking to God, that he was submitting to God as higher than him. He was showing the whole nation of Israel, uh, we are following God, not me. Even though I am God's man on God's mission with God's people, I submit. I submit. So when we follow Christ today, when we follow Christ, are we giving him our entire trust like Joshua did? Have you given him all of your loyalty? Or have you set some aside for a part of your life? Have you set some aside for your boss at work that's higher than God? Tell me, it's mid-year time for a lot of companies where you get your mid-year performance reviews. When you get a bad one, what emotions go through you? Does your view of yourself change? That's sometimes an indicator that your identity is in something other than the word of the Lord. That wasn't what Joshua did. He was ready to obey God's word even at a cost to him. He was joining God's army. He was declaring with his whole heart that he would follow the king's call wherever it led. Wherever it led. He gave God everything. And when we follow Christ, we declare we're joining his team, not the other way around. We're not trying to recruit God to our cause or our way of doing things. We're saying, Lord, you're the Lord. What do you want me to do? What are your orders? And I will follow. That is exactly what we do when we give our faith to God. Not only for salvation, but Romans 10 says, if you declare him Lord, you shall be saved. Sometimes we struggle with that part. Sometimes we struggle with saying, is it really every decision? Is it really every aspect of my life? Yes, it is. When we follow Christ, we declare that his standard is the standard by which we live. So what does this look like? What does it look like to make Jesus the holy one of our lives? Well, I think one way is when Jesus is the holy one of our lives, we reflect the holiness of Jesus like a mirror. We reflect it onto other people. Joshua experienced this. God made the, whole, the ground underneath his feet holy, sacred, set apart than any other place on this planet. This spot of ground was holy because God said so. 1 Peter 1.6 says, be holy because I am holy. God set himself apart from any other commander, any other warrior, anything else. And he said, I am unique. And so for us, this means we need to look, we need to act, we need to give, we need to lead, we need to work, we need to love in a holy way, in a way that is totally different from this world. This world should look at us and say, dude, you're kind of weird. And we should say, thank you, <laughs> because that's the way it's supposed to be. 
We are supposed to look weird to people who don't understand this because we are following a holy God that's not like anything they've experienced. It's not this moralistic, if you do for me, I do for you. It's none of that. It's I'll give sacrificially to you. I will lead sacrificially to you. I'll take the bullet, you know, proverbially, um, at work when you mess up. I'll give you grace. When everybody else is losing their ever-loving minds, I'll stay calm because my focus is eternity. Not right now. Not the stock price. Not the quarter earnings. That's what it means to be holy, to be different. You know, the U.S. Navy experienced this. They thought they had a morale issue, a major problem in, during World War II on the USS West Virginia because you had a bunch of sailors who stopped drinking, cursing, smoking, sleeping around. They didn't do any of that all of a sudden. And they sent people to investigate. They're like, what's going on? Do we have, a, do we have an issue on this battleship? Are we not battle ready? What had happened was Dawson Troppen had showed up, who is the founder of the Navigators, and he led somebody to Christ. And then that person led somebody to Christ. And that person led somebody to Christ. And before you knew it, you had a revival break out on a battleship. And all of these soldiers said, okay, I get it. If he's our commander now, we should do what he says. What are his orders? No question. No debate. They didn't take a poll. <laughs> okay, these are, these, are, these are men of service. So the Navy figured out pretty quick they didn't have a morale issue. They had a Jesus issue. Because these soldiers got it immediately. My life should reflect my commander. My life should reflect my commander. When Jesus is the holy one of our lives, we reflect the holiness of Jesus. The second thing I think this shows up in our lives is the holiness of God's authority in our lives. The standard of the Christian life equals the holiness of God's authority. Said another way, when Jesus is the holy one of our lives, we submit to God's authority. He's in charge. Let me say that again. He's in charge. I know in this country we don't think highly of kings, but he's the king. And we've never experienced one like him because he's holy. He's in charge. Unquestioned. There is no impeachment process for him. Joshua experienced this, both in Joshua's kneeling, complete, and his words, my Lord, it showed the standard of submitting to God's authority. I will put myself at risk for you because I trust you. I trust in your character. I trust you are who you say you are. I trust you have nothing but the good for me. So whatever you want to do, do to me. You are my Lord. That's the standard. I'm not saying you have to be perfect at it. Romans 5 says, when grace or when sin abounds, grace literally, the Greek says, superabounds. Sin cannot outrun the avalanche of Christ's grace. But the standard is God's authority. That's what our aiming point should be. For us, that means our loyalty to Him is above all others. Deuteronomy 6 5 says, You shall love the Lord with some of your heart? No, all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your strength. Everything we've got should be submitted to him and we should love him with that. Dwight Robertson said, your intimacy with God is the greatest gift you can give this world. Fathers, it is the greatest gift you can give your children. Mothers, it is the greatest gift you can give your children or your spouses. That is the greatest gift to say, guys, I know we got a big decision to make as a family. Let's pray about it. That's the greatest gift you can show your children is to show your allegiance to the king. To say, I'm not in charge. I might be the leader of this family, but I submit like Joshua to the king. How many of us here need to do that again? How many of us here have let that slip? Have said, I'm, I'm the master of my own destiny. We're not. Not if we call him Lord. For us, it also means that his opinion of us is the highest, most important, supreme one in your life. His opinion of you is what counts, period. Proverbs 9.10 says this. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The, the reverence of the God. The reverence of God is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One, the Holy One, is understanding. 
And look, I know Christian is a, Christianity is a collection of paradoxes, right? If you want to gain your life, you have to lose it. The God who did nothing wrong sacrificed himself for the people who were enemies of him. It's a whole bunch of paradoxes. We could spend a whole morning looking at all the paradoxes of Christianity. But here's the one that applies here. If we're going to stand with Jesus, we first have to kneel with him. We have to kneel to him if we're going to stand for him. If you won't kneel to God, can't call him Lord. When I came to faith, I was 16 years old. I was a Texas high school varsity football player. If you know, you know. And so uh, I came to faith and, and I, I gave my life to Christ because I said, look, I don't want to go to hell. It wasn't complicated for me. <laughs> I was like, I'm a sinner. I need grace. I, you know, if I don't do this, here's where I go. I don't want to spend another second debating this. I kneel down in my bedroom by myself and said, Jesus, I give you my life. I told my girlfriend the next day, I did it. She's like, did what? I said, gave my life to Christ. Her jaw, kunk, what? It's like, yeah, like, wasn't at a retreat. I was just, this is simple, right? I believe there is a God. I believe I'm not him, right? There's a standard I can't achieve on my own. So I gave my life to Christ. Then I became Texas high school varsity football player who loved Jesus, right? So I still wore my varsity my Letterman's jacket because if you know, you know, even in 95 degree heat, you wear this like really hot, uncomfortable jacket because it has a football on it right? And you're the, you're the bee's knees. But underneath that, I, I wore shirts that said, Jesus is Lord, right? Which was great because it covered up the back that said, duh, that's obnoxious. Don't do that. But I was not ashamed of the gospel. I took off like a rocket. Nobody could dissuade me. I had my Bible next to me. I, my, I, I didn't even put it in my book bag. I just carried it around with me. Everywhere I went, if we had time in class, I'd be reading my Bible. Sometimes uh, my, my uh, small group at high school, we'd be debating something like, like Romans, like how do we sin if God made us a new creation? And so we had time in class, we'd be debating that, right? I was not ashamed of the gospel, for I believed it's the power of God for the salvation of all who believe, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. That's Romans 1. But I got sucked into this world. A few years later, I walked away from God. I stopped going to church. I made business my focus. I made my houses. I made my cars my focus. My athletic pursuits I made my focus. I became the master of my domain. I said, God, you're no longer in charge of me. And for 10 or so years, that's how it stayed. And I'll tell you, I told somebody at the last service, somebody walked up to me and, and said, hey, you gotta change. I said, get out of my face. Don't you see I'm providing for my family? Don't you see my, my, my kids have nice clothes, we have nice cars, we live in a nice neighborhood, it's got one of those gator thingamajigger things in the front of it. What's wrong? But inside it was hollow. Inside it was empty. Inside it was horrific what was happening in my heart. And I was a terrible father. And I was a terrible husband. And I was a terrible boss. Yes, it looked whitewashed on the outside, but there was nothing in there worth, redeem worth redeeming. God in his mercy started calling me back. And I went to a men's retreat. And I was faced with a choice at this men's retreat. I didn't go to the men's retreat to have this choice. I went to the men's retreat because it had mountain biking and they had steak. Doc, just, hey, I'm just being honest, right? It was steak. And you got to cook your own steak and you sang the steak song. You guys want to hear it? Steak. That's it. It was a men's retreat. There was no other rhymes, no, no other. That's it. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. So it was at stake in mountain biking. I was in, right? But at this, at this retreat, God got a hold of me, and he put this in front of me. And he said, Matt, do you believe that my opinion of you is the highest? Do you believe my opinion of you over your own? Because, see, I've been coming back to the Lord. I've been going to church. I've been reading my Bible. If you looked at my journals, I've been journaling almost every day. Like, oh, this is really cool in Ephesians. Oh, I wonder what this means. Let me go look that up. I mean, I've been doing all the things. But I was caught in this prison. And some of us here might be caught in the same prison of guilt and shame and regret of all the things for those 10 years that I'd put my family through or the people that reported to me, of all the things that I had done. And I thought, you know, I just can't be ashamed anymore. I can't be, can't be uh, unashamed because don't you know what I did? And God put, for, put before me with this speaker. The speaker said, look, if you're struggling with forgiveness, if you're struggling with understanding the forgiveness of God, think about it like this. God doesn't forget anything. He's omniscient. He knows everything. 
that has happened and that will happen. That's part of his character. So it's not like he forgets your sins, but he refuses to bring them back up. Let me say that again. When God forgives us, he refuses to bring it back up. And it was like right to my soul. Because I realized in that moment that the only person bringing back up my past sins was me. And God said, all right, are you ready to trust me? Are you ready to lean into me? Are you ready to take my opinion of you, Matt, who is redeemed, who is my son, who is chosen, who is gifted, who is ready? Are you ready to, are you ready to take me at my word, Matt? Or are you still going to believe your own self? And from that moment, I said, God, I'm in. I had two consistent prayers. I said, God, use me. I don't care what I'm doing. I just want to be useful to you. I want to be useful to the king. And talk to me. Let me learn your voice again. Because I want to be able to distinguish your voice from my voice. And he has been faithful to me every day since. But that's what it looks like to make his opinion greater than our own. When Jesus is the Holy One of our lives, we submit to God's authority. Third, we'll wrap with this, that the standard of Christian life is equal to the holiness of our obedience to God's commands. Said another way, when Jesus is the Holy One of our lives, we obey God's commands. When Jesus is the Holy One of our lives, we obey God's commands. This is what Joshua did. Joshua said, my Lord, what do you command me to do? And God said, take off your sandals. Joshua didn't go back to his officers and say, what do you think I should do? He didn't take a poll. There was no vote. He obeyed. He obeyed. Sometimes we tend to complicate this. Uncomplicate it this morning. If we love God, we obey his commands. That is speaking God's love language according to John 14, which says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That is God's love language, obedience. If he is the holy one of our lives, then his commands are our standard. His commands are our marching orders. There is a whole list of standing orders in here. Before we ask for new ones, let's make sure we know what these are. Let's follow these. When we follow and we obey God's commands, we prove who our master is. Romans 6.16 says, Don't you know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? Who are you obeying? Whose commands are you obeying? Whose opinion of you are you obeying? Whose standard of good enough are you saying, well, so-and-so said this is good enough. So that's where I'll stop. How many of us here have lowered the bar from God's holiness to somebody else's definition of good? When we obey God, we are declaring he's our master. When we obey God, we're laying a strong foundation. In Luke 6, it says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? But the person who does what I say is like a man who builds on a foundation, and he digs deeply and, 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 and lays a strong foundation and it goes on to say, and when the wind comes and the storms comes and the hail comes and then the hail comes again and then the hail comes again and then the tornadoes come. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> it's just a weather joke. Um, sorry. Thank you. Just relax. Okay. Uh, it, it could not be shaken because it had been well built. When we obey God's command, that's our foundation. That's our foundation. It shows trust even when it's difficult. I mean, God's most frequent command is do not fear. We have nothing to lose by obeying God. Nothing. Because the thing that, we most value, that is most valuable to us resides in heaven and can never be taken away from us. Let me give you just one example of when it's really hard. I mentioned Corey Ten Boone earlier. She was a prisoner in a, in a concentration camp during World War II. She and her sister died in this concentration camp, and she has books and stories, and it's, it's just the depravity of man is, is real. Um, but when she came out, instead of preaching against Germans, she preached to them, and she preached forgiveness, 
And she said, if you come to God, he will forgive you of your sins. If you come to God, he wants a relationship with you. All you have to do is accept his grace, and it will overwhelm. It will be like an avalanche of grace on whatever has happened to you. So she was preaching at this local church in Germany. In the German tradition, um, it was, they didn't like come up to the preachers afterwards and be like, hey, thanks, good job, nothing wrong with that. That's just not what they did. They just kind of got up and left. They're like, hmm, okay, and they got up and left. So what was unique about this time that she preached is a man came up and came forward to her. And he said, that was amazing. Thank you for coming. You mentioned the prison camp where you were at. I was a guard at that prison camp. After the war ended, I've accepted Christ. And I know God forgives me. But Miss Ten Boom, I need to ask you, will you forgive me? When we obey, it shows trust. Corey's body literally seized. He, he put his hand out, and, and she couldn't even move her muscles, she said. It was like everything just locked up in fear, and all of the emotion and the anguish and the pain came flooding back to her. But when she forgave him, when she reached her hand out and grabbed his, she felt life coming back into her because she was obeying the giver of life. Brothers and sisters, how many of us here are living a life that too closely resembles the world's, that too closely resembles the life of somebody who doesn't have Jesus, who doesn't put him first, who isn't redeemed by him? Corey showed in that moment she trusted God before she trusted herself. And we can do the same thing. God is holy. Therefore, the standard for us as Christians is to make Jesus the holy one of our lives. The holy one of our lives. So what would it look like for us to join God today? To re-enlist in his army. To declare, I'm tired of following myself and I'm ready to give whatever I'm holding back to the Lord. I told you at the beginning, I gave you the invitation. I said, I wanted you to examine. I wanted you to listen to the voice of the Lord to see if there was some aspect of your life that you're holding on to, that your pride won't let you go of. Maybe it's your, maybe it's your self-worth. You say, well, I think I'm good. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your wealth. Maybe it's your status. I don't know what it is. But I know the Lord is active. I know that one of the priorities of Mountain View is for us to learn God's voice this year like I prayed. And so I know we don't do this often, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond. Not to me, but to him. Not to my voice, but his voice. I, I, I don't care if you're old or young or somewhere in the middle. The Lord of the universe is might be speaking to you today and there's something on your mind, there's something on your heart, there's something that as you've listened, you've said, I haven't given this up to God. And I just want to give you a moment. I'm going to pray, for, I'm going to start praying for us. And while I'm praying, I'm just going to give you a moment to respond to God. This isn't for me, this is for you. This is like my moment at that retreat where I finally had to say, yes, God, your opinion is the one I'm going to trust from this moment forward. And I was released from my prison of shame and guilt. So I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to give you that moment. All I'm going to encourage you to do is listen to the voice of the Lord. Lord Jesus, we declare and acknowledge that your spirit is here today. We declare and acknowledge that you are Lord of the heavens, that you are Lord of the universe, that you are the only Holy One, that you are worthy of our honor, worthy of our trust, worthy of our praise. We declare that. We embrace that. We lo Lord, we also declare that you are active, that your spirit convicts us that that's its role 
is to convict us, to lead us in all truth, that your spirit is here, that your spirit is with us. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now that your voice would be clear. That your voice would be the thought that's coming to their mind. That your voice would be the, the desire that's in their, in their soul, in their, in their body, in their mind, that's overwhelming them. That you talk to them, that you speak to us, Lord. <laughs> I pray that you'd reveal if there's something we're holding back. I pray that you'd reveal if there's something that we haven't given to your authority. That there's some part of our life that doesn't reflect your holiness. Would you reveal that to us right now? Brothers and sisters, as we stay right where we're at, right as we're at, I invite you to respond physically in some way that the Lord is leading you. It could be raising your hand. It could be standing. The altar's open. If you want to come down here, if you're feeling called to bow as Joshua did, whatever it is, I invite you to raise your hand. If there's something that God is asking you to give up, if there's something that God's asking you to release, as a sign, as a, as, a, as a way to tell God, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you, Lord. Maybe you want to stand. Maybe you want to take a stand. This isn't for anybody else around here. This is between you and the Lord. But if he's telling you to do something, why wait? Why debate it? Just raise your hand to him and say, I hear you. Stand up say, I hear you. Bow down to say, I hear you. I submit myself. I re-enlist. Praise the Lord. I see those. This can be your Joshua moment. The God of Joshua, the God of Moses is here in this room. And he wants nothing in between you and him. So if there's something he's pointing out, just respond to him. Let him know. Praise the Lord. Let's take just 15 more seconds. Don't hold back. He's faithful. He's true. He is gracious. He's loving and kind. He always has been and he always will. Thank you, Lord, for the hands. Thank you for the people who have stood. Thank you for those that Their hearts are bowing. Their hearts are raising their hands because you see hearts even if I can't. Lord, we praise you for your work this morning. We ask that you would help us to encourage each other for as long as it is today. Keep working with us. Keep talking to us, Father. For you are faithful and you are good and you are the Holy One. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you to Pastor Matt for that powerful word that he shared with us today. Uh, Now we will turn our hearts towards a time of communion. So hopefully you gathered your elements on your way in. And if you are online, I invite you to join that, uh, to do that now as we prepare our hearts to take communion I pray that this could be a time, these next few moments, where you continue to reflect on all that Matt talked to us about today. Um, And we have this opportunity in our service each week where we pause and think about this new covenant that has been established through the broken body, through the blood of Jesus on the cross. And he told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. Paul reiterated that in Corinthians, that when you gather together, Do this in remembrance of Christ and the new covenant that has been established by his blood. So that's why we do that regularly here at Mountain View, to pause and take that inventory between us and the Lord and remember that this is where it began. Joshua was under the old covenant um, all throughout the Old Testament. 
where there was agreement of God's faithfulness to his people, he established those covenants again and again through uh, different leaders and reiterated that. Um, But in the New Testament, as the prophets foretold, there would be a new covenant that was established through Christ. Ezekiel foretold of this in Ezekiel 36, where the the Lord said through the prophet, um, said that there will be a new covenant coming where he says, I will remove from you a heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you to move you to obey me and follow my decrees. So under the old covenant with all the law, the people strived, they tried, they were always falling up short, just as we fall up short as well. But they did not have that indwelling Holy Spirit to empower them to obey, to hear the voice of the Lord, to um, guide and counsel and all the things that the Holy Spirit does in and through as it's indwelling within us. We are told in the new covenant, as Jesus established it at that time of communion, like we're going to take today. But then we're told in Ephesians that when we place our faith in Jesus, when we receive him as Lord and Savior, his Holy Spirit actually comes and dwells within us. That it's a seal of the promise of the inheritance that is to come for us in eternity with Christ. So we have that Holy Spirit in us. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, you can be assured that his spirit is within you. It's living and active, and it works in coordination through his living word. So when we quiet ourselves like we have today, and when you do that, daily, hopefully, make that a part of your life where you open his word. His spirit will speak to you through his word. So I know in my own life that that is part of my journey of learning to not just see the Bible as written words on a page, but to really see it as living and active and in coordination with the Holy Spirit within me to start to listen and begin to obey to what God's Spirit is saying. And that's how he changes us. That's how he grows us in obedience. He moves us, like he foretold in Ezekiel, to follow his decrees, to walk in obedience to him, to actually value, like Matt said, his opinion above all else and all the other voices in our life. So this is the starting point where Jesus established that new covenant. That is what we're celebrating in communion. So as you take the the little piece of bread, as you drink the juice, may you reflect on that, your faith in this new covenant and in the indwelling Holy Spirit that you have as your helper and the word he has given us to teach us and shape us. Embrace all of that today. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much that you are faithful. You are true, just as you foretold and as the the men and women of old in the Old Testament looked forward to in faith. You told us that there would be this day of the new covenant, that you would send your son to establish that new covenant, that you would wipe away our sin, though it was red as crimson, you would make us as white as snow, and you would set apart a people for yourself in relationship with you, with your indwelling Holy Spirit. Thank you that we are the bride of Christ. We are on this side of the cross. We celebrate your death and your resurrection today. We celebrate that you have begun a good work in us, as you tell us in Philippians. And you will never abandon that good work, but you will carry it on to completion until that day of Christ. And each one of us are your good works. You are doing a good work in everybody in this room, Lord. Help us to be encouraged in that today that you will never abandon the good work that you have begun in us. And you will continue it on to completion. That just as Matt shared today in his testimony, even in those times when we wander away from you, you, Holy Spirit, have set us apart as your people and you will continue to draw us back to your side. Lord, we thank you that once we've placed our faith in you, Lord, you will never leave us nor forsake us. You are always with us. Your spirit is with us. And we can never wander too far from your fold. You will leave the 99 to come and search for us and draw us back to your side, Lord. So we praise you and thank you, Lord. We rededicate ourselves to you today, Lord. We enlist ourselves to you just as Joshua did. We prostrate ourselves to you. Lord, would you speak to us? Would you show us the areas that we need to change that maybe we aren't in walking in obedience to your word? We're not seeing a situation correctly. We're not living out your commands as you've called us to. Would you lead us and guide us as only you can do? Would you convict us? Would you show us? Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Would you stand as we continue to worship together? And I search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough you came along and you put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love hey. Lord there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Yes, I know it's true And I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley There's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again
Good morning again. Uh, as always, Pastor Rob's in the back. If you need prayer, we would encourage you to go see him or the prayer team in the back as a way of announcements. Uh, we've been contacted by Aging Resources of Colorado, about of Douglas County, I'm sorry, about helping elderly clean up uh, this week uh, from the storm. And so if that's something that you're available to do, uh, please reach out to Tracy, and uh, she's coordinating that effort. I uh, also wanted to remind everyone that one week from today, uh, there's going to be one service at 9 o'clock. It's going to be outdoors, and there's no children or student ministry uh, services next week. So everybody will be out outside in the backyard for a service at 9. So uh, pray with me, please. Father, again, we just want to take this opportunity to thank you for the privilege uh, of being in your house today and just pray that we would never take that privilege for granted. And Father, we just thank you for the challenges that Matt has shared with us this morning and uh, just trust that we are listening to your voice in our lives on things that we need to give up for you. And Father, uh, we just pray that as we go now that you would just give us boldness uh, as we interact with those around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.